Hello everyone. Um, I'm sorry about the um, about the YouTube connection. Um, uh, I'm gonna be waiting for my guest to be on Instagram now, and hopefully for the best, um, he will be online and we will be able to have our um, interview. Okay, that light was really bothering my eyes. So here I am, just waiting for my um, my guest to connect, and hopefully, I hope he will be doing it very soon. Um, hi, Moises. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? Um, and uh, well, hello to everyone who is um, just getting online to see the um, the interview through through Instagram. As I said, I'm very sorry that it didn't work out with with the YouTube platform. But my guest was having um, some internet platform, computer, everything at the whole time, problems. And um, I just hope that um, he will be able to uh, get online soon. Because um, otherwise, well, here I am. If you have any questions for me until he gets, um, he gets online, well, just feel free to ask me whatever you want to, to ask. I will feel free to respond or not. So, anything you wish to tell me, ask me, um, whatever. Moises, um, uh, Moises is a sound technician. He's a he's he's been working not for long, but he is quite a good and big professional. And I interviewed him yesterday. You can watch um, his interview in my um, Cuenta Melo con un Café YouTube channel in Spanish, of course, and um, this time we will be doing the interview um, for our guest of today in English, which um, I hope he will be online very soon. And, um, well, here I am. As I said, it's quite difficult just to go on talking and talking by yourself. If you don't have a uh, and that's mea culpa. If you don't have, you know, you should have. That's something really important. We should all have, us who do directs, we should all have sort of like a small um, uh, text that, you know, you just use and just do a sort of like a monologue whenever you're waiting for someone to get on direct and have uh, an interview with you. So... Um, I really don't know what to say. I am, um, I'm really, I was really, really, and still am very, very happy to be able to um, interview. Ciao, ciao Rico, come stai? Bene, spero di sì. E mi piace vederti qua. So, Ulrico is a friend of mine. He's from, uh, he's from uh, Italy and um, he, I don't know where he is now. I don't know if he's in Madrid or, or in Italy. And here we have Diego, who is a friend of mine from Villa Fames. He's a very good friend of mine, one of my besties. And he's always there giving me support. Um, and, um, well, what else? What else? What else? Well, all these people here, which I know, I know a lot of you are there and you would love to ask me a question. So don't be shy. Just go on. Ask me the question. As I said, um, I may answer or I may not answer. So, Diego, have you got any questions for me? Ulrico, I could see a see. Oh, look who's there. My son. My son, Manuel. What happened? Here we are. He's not going to ask me a question anyways. Um, so, who wants to ask me a question? Um, oh, our guest is here. Finally. Yay. Hey, yay. Finally. We're having our interview. Okay. I knew it. I knew it. Hello. Oh, hello. I'm finally here. <laughs> Finally, finally, finally. Let me I'm so you. sorry to give you I, all this trouble. I know. I know you're sorry. I'm sorry too. We're all sorry. But well I'm, um I'm very bad with technologies, I'm sorry. Nah, don't worry. Um uh, you know, people get 
after some time, people just start understanding what directs and lives are. I would like to ask uh, answer a question that someone asked before, which and this mm -hmm. person is my son. I don't know what we're going to have for dinner today, and if uh, we will be waiting for you to come home and fix dinner for us. So that will be great. Tonight we will be having my son in the kitchen cooking for us. Great. <laughs> Let me know what it's for dinner. When you know it, let me know. Yeah, nah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. So, um, I'm not going to be cooking, so um, oh, okay. I call me either. So, great. Um, all right. So, as soon as you are ready. Yeah, I'm just going to pick up some headphones because I was trying to connect um, a lava, lavalier microphone to the, to the cell phone because I'm still in my office and downstairs there's, there's a lot of echo. There's like really, really echo. And so it would be a really unpleasant conversation. Mm -hmm. But uh, I came upstairs and I hope the, the audio is better. I hope there's not too much echo now, but I'm gonna put some headphones because the, the volume is really low. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I think I can hear you. Can you hello, hear hello. Me? Hello. Yeah, hello. now it's perfect. I hope you can hear me well also. I can hear you perfectly now. I can hear you well. Yeah, that's great. Okay, great. Now I can see your face well. Okay, perfect. Uh, here's my coffee. <laughs> I don't have coffee. I was waiting to have my <laughs> bottle of water. Okie doke. So can we proceed? You. Can we proceed? Yes, of course, of course. Okay. Okay. Do you have good connection? Good internet connection? Hello? Hello, hello. I was hearing okay, you well. Free? Okay, yeah, but you are freezing a bit. Okay, so yeah. everything's good? Yeah, yeah, I'm great. Okay. So um let's proceed. All right. Good hello, how are you guys? <laughs> Excuse me. I was just saying hello, Yasmin. Thank you for your invitation. Okay. okay, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for being there. Okay, so um, welcome again to um, Tell Me Over Coffee. Our guest of today was born in Lisbon. He got through an art school, an art high school, and made it through the Portuguese Conservatory Film School, where he got his bachelor's degree in film production. Later on, he went to Brazil and got a major in film directing at the UFF Rio de Janeiro. And back in Portugal, he majored in script writing. After working as an actor in 2005, he founds his production company, Guerrilla Films, not knowing that many good things were coming on his way. He wrote, produced, and directed the short film, One Night Bullet which premiered at the New York Film Festival, has been selected to festivals around the world and has had a huge success in Portugal. He has also directed music videos in the past 20 years to top Portuguese artists and also British, French and Argentinian artists. He directed his first TV commercial in 2009 and won the Mention d'Honneur in Milan at the Sports Movie and TV Fest. The commercial, whose campaign for Coca-Cola he directed in 2011, was selected to Cannes. One of his TV series, Melancomic, was considered most original TV series by Time Out magazines two years in a row. His first feature film, Nirvana, a gangster odyssey, got theatrical distribution in 2014. It was nominated for Best Action Indie Movie in Film, Indie Film, excuse me, in Los Angeles, AOF Fest, and Best Original Song at the Portuguese Film Academy Awards. He co-directed the art house feature film, Train Station, selected to festivals around the world and winner of Best Film at the LA Diversity Film Festival and Best Picture at the Kosovo International Film Festival. In 2016, 
He created Cinepop, a theater dedicated to screen iconic films from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. In 2018, he finished, to, in 2018, he finished his debut documentary, Lost Records, about youth and its relationship with music in the 80s in an isolated island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. He is currently prepping his next feature, Stranded Blood, a coming of age drama. As an actor, he is known for Inspector Max as Wilson, Criminoso Volta Sempre ao Local do Crimen as himself, Janela Indiscreta as himself. As a director, he is known for Uma Vida Toda Empatada, Lost Records, Train Station, Nirvana, O Film, A Lei, a Lei Dos Outros. As producer, he is also known for Lost Records, Train Station, Nirvana, A Lei Dos Outros. As a writer, as for Train Station, Nirvana, A Lei Dos Outros. And as an editor, Lost Records, Train Station, Nirvana, Nirvana O Film, A Lei Dos Outros. Tiago Pedro da Carvalho, bem-vinda. Thank you. Muito obrigado, muito obrigado. Muchas gracias. <laughs> so, um, I always like to ask this question to all my guests, or almost all my guests. How yeah. and when did it all start? Is anyone in your family in the show business? Uh, well, uh, actually, yes, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if that was an influence. I think there's a lot of things in our lives that we don't realize that they influence us. So, I mean, if I think objectively, I, I would say no. My my mother, she's, um, well, the, the literal translation would be discography promoter. She promotes mm -hmm. music, music musicians. She works for a, a label, or she used to work. For, for, uh, for, for several music labels in, in mm -hmm. Portugal. And so, my, and she was a single mother. And so my childhood was uh, in uh, studios with rock bands and pop bands, and, you know, <laughs> around musicians. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but this is music uh, and not film, not television. Um, what I can say uh, about this, this art or this entertainment uh, industry is that I was addicted to TV since I was a kid. Uh, mm -hmm. I have no logical explanation for it. Uh, I was hooked on television, I was hooked on TV series, I was hooked on films, I was hooked on cartoons, and mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time by myself just watching TV and with my video recorder recording whatever it was and then re-watching it a thousand times. And since I was a little boy, I wanted to be a part of it. Of course, I didn't know what a director was, uh, mm -hmm. I didn't know what a producer was or whatever, but I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be a part of that realm. And, um, and that's how it started. And then, you know, just growing up and trying to be different things. Um, and then I really came up to do what I dreamed about when I was a child. Okay. Um, as I said in your presentation, you um, are, are, were an actor. What made, yeah. you, what made you decide it was time to create your own production company, Gazilla Film? Well, uh, when I worked, and, and I still work occasionally as, a, as an actor, uh, I did it just for fun, you know, uh, because uh, I think I kind of... I was and I am good at it. <laughs> and I started to work on commercials when I was uh, very young. And then I did some theater. Um, then I did, you know, a couple of small small parts on TV series and soap operas. Uh, mm -hmm. Telenovela, in the Latins, they know what telenovela is. <laughs> uh, and, um, but, but yeah, I just did it because just like I told you since I was a boy that I love, you know, the, everything about this. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, what I'm passionate about the most is uh, to be a director. 
but everything is fun for me. I love to produce and I love to act and I also compose songs, you know, and uh, I have a I have music band also. And so that was just for fun. So it's not like, I'm not sure if, if that's what your impression was, but it's not like I was having a, an acting career and then decided to, to, to start the guerrilla films. I was just acting. It was just one of the 1,000 things that I do at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I was studying already on film school because I already wanted to become uh, a director. And uh, the reason, I, the main reason why I started uh, this company, this humble production company, was that I was very lucky that when I started to direct, uh, most of the times I was directing um, straight to the client. So I wasn't having a producer contacting me and hiring me to, to direct something uh, to the client. I was being co contacted by the clients. Um, and because in the beginning, even now, not just in the beginning, but in the beginning, the, the budgets are so low, I, I couldn't, you know, have big teams and a producer, you know, for music videos. It just didn't make sense to pay to have a producer and pay to have a director, you know, and so I was producing and directing at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought, might as well just start my own production company because uh, I'm already having so many productions, uh, you know, coming one after another. Um, and that's how it started. As you know, we are many pursuing our dreams. Some make it and others don't. Mm -hmm. I know I usually say this to almost all my, in, in almost all my interviews, and, and I may sound very negative, but it's the truth. So we have to face it. It's not an easy industry, and we have to be constantly evolving in order to differ, in, our, in my case as an actress, from other fellow actors. Is, does this happen also with film directors? Do, do, do you think that um, you have to constantly be changing or, or evolving in order to be different from another film um, director? What makes you different from other filmmakers? Well, the second question I really can't answer. <laughs> People will have to watch my work and, and they will be the ones, you know, answering that. But, uh, but the first question, Uh, I think there's a mix of, uh, and I'm not sure about the dosage, you know, the percentage of the dosages, the dosage of, of this mix, but uh, there's definitely a mix about worrying about being different and about evolving, you know, uh, and when I say evolving, I'm, I'm talking about being aware of the different types of communications and languages um, that we're having, you know. Sometimes I have some conversations with, with some fellow filmmakers and a lot of us, uh, I'm, I'm pushing 39 years. And so we are very, we have a very cinematic language still, you know. For us, uh, we really don't like, or it's difficult for us to like and to work with these new languages, you know, these uh, mm -hmm. cell phone languages. You, you have already music videos, you know, with the aesthetic of a cell phone. Mm -hmm. and, um, and viewers, they don't, you know, most of them, I think, or at least a big part, they kind of don't, they don't give a damn anymore about kind of cinematic language, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, if, if it's there for the better, you know, okay, cool, it is cinematic. But uh, it's not what's important. Well, I mean, it's not what's it's most important anymore. Uh, now it's really, well, if you're talking about TV series and movies, it, the thing that it's most important, I'm glad that it still is that, which is the story. I mean, it's the story, you know. People are hooked on, on, on the story. But, uh, but until about 20 years ago or 10 years ago, the story plus that cinematic effect would make you different, you know, would, would place you in another step uh, of, of being a professional filmmaker. And then you had the amateurs that had this different language. And now this different language 
of the so-called amateurs, it's the language, you know, it, it, it's, it's the language that everyone is doing and it's the language that it's appreciated. And, you know, nobody's yeah. going to say, I, I don't want to see that show or I don't like that music video because it has this rawness language, you know, like a cell phone. It's like, yeah, what matters is what's inside, you know, what it, where is the cell phone pointing? And so in that sense, of course, that we have to be aware of technology and aesthetics, you know, the language of, of, of society itself, mm -hmm. how this society can communicate now visually. Um, but also, and that's why I'm talking about a mix, you should, all, you should also believe in yourself, you know, because ultimately that's what's going to make you different from the others, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. I think there's a lot of people uh, worrying themselves about being different. And I usually say, you should not be worrying about being different. You should be worried about being yourself. Because if you, if you are yourself, in a way, I don't know which, but in a way you will be different. Because we are all the same, but we all have our own identity. And if you, if you are true to yourself, people will understand that from your work, you know, mm -hmm. they will, they will look at it and they will, see, even if it's not the most original thing, you know, it's not like, oh my God, I've never seen anything like that, but it doesn't have to be like that. Okay. Uh, I think it's, it's more important that people look at it and say, I felt this, you know, I mean, He's talking about something that it's real and uh, it, it's real for him. It's real for him because I, I can sense it and I can feel it. And so I think that's much more important. Uh, just try to, be, try to be yourself because when you're trying to be different, even if you don't want, you are going to be like someone else. Okay. You know, I have to be different. I have to be different. And you're forcing, you're forcing something, you know. Don't try to force to be something that comes from the outside. Just mm -hmm. hear the inside and, um, and from the inside, you know, just try to make things without having too many, too many references from, from the past that you will always have. You know? okay. So it's like be aware of what's going on, but be yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fact that you've, you've worked as an actor does that make you understand them better when you are directing them? Well, from my perspective, yes, because I, I mean, I, I've had some, I had some really intense experiences as a, as an actor, you know, like dramatizing. Uh, there weren't much, <laughs> I, the intense ones, the intense experiences, mm -hmm. but they, but they were enough for me, you know, like to really know what's going inside, you know? It's not just like I read it in books and it's not like I had some drama classes, you know, and directing classes and the teachers taught me this and taught me that. No, I've been through it, you know? It's, it's just like the same thing as being a captain or a general, and, uh, but you, you've been in the trenches, you know? Yeah. Uh, the difference from the ones that came from the academy and because they had, you know, high scholar values, they went directly to, to general. And then you had the other ones that were general, but, but they've been there and it will be completely different. Okay. Um, you are a director, you're mm -hmm. a producer, you're a screenwriter, you're an editor. I mean, you're a lot in, 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 in all this behind the, the camera. Out of all yeah. that, which one is your favorite? Well, that, that's easy. I mean, uh, it's definitely directing, you know. It's, uh, it's what I always, I mean, wanted to do even when I didn't know what a director was, you know. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to tell stories and I always wanted to tell them in a, in a video or film format, you know? That's what I always wanted to do. Even when I was a little boy and I was watching movies, like I told you that I was already in love with it, 
-hmm. Even if I, you know, loved uh, the English, use this word for a lot of things in Portugal. I think, I think also in Spanish, you, you differ the words, but they say love to everything. Mm -hmm. So um, I liked a lot to act, you know, and to be an actor and to be in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. But uh, even when I was a boy, I wanted to tell the story. Uh, I started to doing this a little bit more serious since I was 11 because mm -hmm. uh, my neighbors, they, they bought a, a handicam. Okay. And so since I was 11, that I'm making movies with my friends, like real movies with beginning, middle and end. And um, the thing that most gave me, you know, passion was, was to tell the story. I was always the one writing the story and then saying, let's do this and let's do that. And I'm going to shoot over there. And so, yeah, that, that's, it's, it's directly. It's telling the story and working with actors. I love okay. working with actors. It's, it's, yeah, okay. it's so good. Mm -hmm. um, in what languages do you consider your creations work best? Portuguese or English? Uh, well, it, it depends. If, if it is in music, uh, uh, it's English. Uh, I write, um, it, it's much more intuitive for me to, to write in English. Uh, not just because I'm fluent in English, but I think it's also because um, it, it's just an easier language. <laughs> it's, uh, it's much easier to rhyme in, uh, uh, in English. Um, and then I would say that if, if, if I'm writing, if, I, if I'm script writing, uh, it, would be, it would be Portuguese because, uh, because characters, you know, they are so complex. Each character has its own voice. Uh, they come from different backgrounds. And so it's, it's so difficult, you know. I mean, I, I could write in English and, and I could write it, write like I know what to write because I'm fluent in it. But uh, I don't, if I have a character that comes from, from Boston or from LA or from New York, I mean, I don't know the, 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 the right way to talk, you know. And, and, and if they come from New York, but they're like, a, They're like uh, someone from Wall Street or someone from, you know, from Brooklyn and all that. So um, I write in English and then um, when I have to translate, uh, I, I'm lucky enough to have a few friends from, from here and there. And so I'll, I'll just tell them, you know, can you please translate this to me for free or I'll pay you symbolically and, uh, and they do it. Mm -hmm. um... You have directed in film, TV, and commercials. Which one or which ones are your favorites and why? Well, that, that's also easy. It's, it, would, it would be film. Film or nowadays TV series because the quality of, of, of television, which is not really television now. It's mm -hmm. Netflix and HBO and whatever. Uh, because... Uh, That's the storytelling in its most uh, pure form, comparing to music videos or, or commercials, of course. There's also storytelling there. But, um, but, but the magic is there, you know? The, there's a story, the first yeah. act and the second and the third, and you, know, and you immerse yourself in, um, in something that lasts an hour and a half or two hours. This is the perspective of a viewer as a director You, you are diving into a world that, you know, for a year or two years, and it's, uh, it's also magic. In Portugal, do you consider that Portuguese productions have the same economic impacts as international ones, not only in the production, but also in the screening in the theaters? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's... Uh, Uh, there's a, a friend of mine, he's a, he's a very famous uh, filmmaker in Portugal, and he said something like, how was it? Um, if, uh, if, if Portuguese cinema stopped instantaneously forever, uh, the rest of the world would, uh, how was it? The rest of the world would notice it just the same as if the Eskimos st stopped uh, producing cinema. 
know, so uh, the P Portuguese productions they are very, very, very low budget, uh, and they they never profit. They never profit uh, unless there's like a miraculous exception, which I don't think it ever happened. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and uh, I, I remember when I started to work in, in this business. And uh, I researched, do you remember the movie Memento from uh, mm -hmm. Christopher Nolan? Yeah. yeah. And so at the time that was considered a very low budget movie. Mm -hmm. Not a very, in the statement that it's an under round. But it was a really low budget movie. And you can see when you watch the movie, you can have a, 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 the sense that it's a low budget movie. You know? mm -hmm. Not just because it has just about four or five characters, and uh, the locations are cheap locations, but also from the look of the movie, you can see that you know it's 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 kind of it's kind of guerrilla making. Um, it kind of reminds the the movies of this really they are now really hype and famous. The, you know the the Jewish brothers, the American Jewish brothers, they, they just directed Uncut yeah. Gems. Yeah, so it it, it kind of looks like their aesthetic twenty years ago. And so 20 years ago, that movie cost $5 million. That's how Memento cost. It cost $5 million. And it, it was a, a really low budget movie. This was 20 years ago. Nowadays, in Portugal, nowadays, the average feature film will cost about a million and a half. And so this is your answer. Okay, so you would be you would be saying that um, the Portuguese government does not, for instance, in France, they invest a lot of money in culture. Would yeah, say, no, no. Would yeah. you say in Portugal that's not how it works? Yeah, there's uh, there's uh, almost equal to none investment in culture in in cultural in culture in general, but especially. Uh, like cinema will be on the bottom rock of the culture uh, okay. display uh, of, uh, of the Portuguese uh, worries about, of the government. How about, how about theater? For instance, I know that in South America, Argentina, Uruguay, they are very much of a pro theater people. They do go to the theater. How about Portugal? Does the theater um, have more importance than, than the cinema? Uh, yeah, I would say that it, it has. Uh, it's also on the on the low bound. It's also, you know, the even uh, last year there was this big, uh, you know, um, how do you say, not a manifestation, but you know, there was this big statement from the the theater professionals mm -hmm. uh, against the Ministry of of Culture because there was no money, uh, absolutely for for theater. But even so. Uh, I could say that you have a theater industry, a theater business, okay. and, and you cannot say that for cinema. There is not an industry, okay. uh, a film in Portugal. There's not like a market uh, mm -hmm. of films, but, but you do have it in theater. I, I can just explain in a few words that I think um, the, the, this happened, like the theater had a a relaunch, uh, maybe about 15 or 20 years ago, when these youngsters soap operas started, Portuguese youngsters soap operas, um, and then they started to have uh, theater productions, you know, you know, very, I'm not gonna say bad, but you know, commercial, co commercial theaters. Mm -hmm. And that caused like a hype around theater and, um, the, 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 the Portuguese people start to create a habit because these mainstream theater plays started to pop out and people were like, yeah, these famous actors are doing these uh, theater plays. Let's go there. And this started to, to revolve uh, an industry around theater. And, uh, and that was good because, because of those commercial theater plays, there is more money to make the other theaters, uh, the, the other plays. Um, do, would you how I don't know how um, how it works in in, in Portugal, uh, culture wise in schools. What? 
I'm listening to you. I'm listening to you. I'm just uh, it's getting dark. So Okay. Um so could you please tell us a little bit on how um culture works in schools? I'm not talking about university. I'm talking about um you know, um middle school and high school. Do you guys have um theater um music um anything that has to do with culture painting uh school? yeah yeah um we have um uh, the uh, a specific music class since uh when i was in school it was from the fifth grade okay. you'd have music classes until about the ninth grade i think mm -hmm. you have to learn how to read you know everything and uh, you you learn a few instruments and then you'd have um, the literal translation would be visual you know you, design you have okay. a design class mm -hmm. and and then you'd have a class of that the literal translation would be manual manual work okay. and you would you would learn how to work with clay with wood with mm -hmm. with with a lot of things uh i think nowadays music classes are from the first grade in in public schools in most public schools mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, from the maybe from the seventh grade i'm not sure you would have like uh, you would have a, cla a theater class a drama mm -hmm. class mm -hmm. but you would have a few classes like portuguese class or english class usually classes that are related to languages or to to literature we in portugal we, we say humanities the department of humanities mm -hmm. it's portuguese english you know um and so those classes we would have, the, the the professors the teachers would prepare a theater in christmas uh, you know or in yeah, easter play. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah um many of you may not know this and i think um and i think that it's the only country that portugal is the only country in the world to do this i've known this because um well i don't know if it has changed but i don't think so my mother she was portuguese also and she would tell me that it was really um special to to go to the to to go to the the, the cinema and you would see and watch all these um international films um yep. subtitled in portuguese so why do you think that portugal one day a long time ago decided not to dub the international films and just subtitle them yeah i think um i, I think it, I, i'm not sure if it was one day they decided not to do it or if what's the matter yeah i'm just I'm just saying goodbye to my 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 beautiful assistant goodbye bia goodbye. say goodbye to you all bye bye <laughs> um okay uh, i'm not sure if i i think it was right from the beginning that they, they never dubbed it you know uh i can't really be sure but uh, they just they, they, they just started the habit of of dubbing stuff when i was about maybe 15 uh, years old um i remember that i had this really this teacher you know those kinds of teachers that they know everything and they tell mm -hmm. you about everything mm -hmm. and uh, i i can't really tell you the specific reason but one of the things that i can, I can tell you that it has to do with um uh, uh portugal portugal was a dictatorship and um one of the and this was really serious in the united states uh, the, their plans to to get to get the countries you know to to americanize okay the world uh in every in every in every deal that they would make and i'm talking about the military I'm talking about political deals mm -hmm. uh in every deals that they would make with with another country there was there were there was always obligations of uh, screening american movies and so this is how how aware they were 
of how powerful language can be, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and and there was uh, one of those deals had to do with, um, um, you know, an Americanizing uh, uh, everything. And so this is one point. The other point in, in Portugal, uh, I think it had to do with, um, we just didn't have the technicians to do that. Okay. <laughs> it's just as... It's just as dumb and uh, as this. We, we didn't have the, the, the technicians to do it. Um, so that the first shows that were dubbed, they were not in Portuguese from Portugal. They were from Brazil because we just didn't have the studios. We didn't have the, 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 the not the manpower, but the, the, the know-how to do it. To do it. Uh, and so we would import cartoons. Cartoons were the first. Uh, we would import cartoons from Brazil, and we would uh, we would watch the, the TV shows or even the the Disney animation uh, features in uh, in Brazilian uh, Portuguese. Um, and so that's why we are also very at ease speaking English. At least the the, the, the people from my age or, or older because we listened to, to the English language uh, since we were born in everything. We, we all, all didn't have Portuguese TV shows. We had, uh, you know, we, have a soap, we had the soap opera, we had the, the newscast, and, you know, just a couple TV shows. And then every TV series was, uh, was American or, or, or English, and the cartoons were also uh, in English. Um, and so um, that's it. Well, that's a good explanation. A good <laughs> and extensive explanation. Sorry. Um, okay. In... <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> um, it's just that I, I, I thought, I always thought that um, they, the reason behind all that was because they believed in the um, originality of, 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 of the language and, and I just thought that was really cool. Yeah, yeah, well. yeah. That, that's more romantic. That's more romantic. It's more romantic, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll keep on thinking it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, in 2016, you create Cinepop, a theater mm. dedicated to, to screening iconic films from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. How, right. did you, how did you come up with this idea? Is it still active? What was and is the goal of this? Well, uh, I wanted to do this uh, maybe, or, or I had this idea maybe 14 years ago. Cinepop is about four years old, almost five, I think. Okay. And so I, I, had, I had this idea about 14 years ago uh, when I was... Uh, 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 doing the premiere of my first short film, One Night Bullet, or in Portuguese, A Lei dos Outros. Uh, I, I screened it in, in a small theater uh, here in a, in, in a Lisbon neighborhood, and it was a theater that was always closed. It, it was never used for anything. And, and it just popped in my head. First, what it popped was, hey, I could use this just to watch movies with my friends. These, these guys, are, they are so pleasant. Maybe they just let me here. And then just, you know, I think it was in a matter of five minutes, okay. this train of thought of watching movies with my friends ended up in, man, wouldn't it be cool if, if there was this, uh, this theater that would just screen iconic movies from, uh, from my childhood? or even before, you know, that kind of guys of movies that it's from the 70s, 80s, until the, the early 90s, you know, that um, even, my, even if my child was, was on, uh, during the 80s, mm -hmm. a lot of the movies that were on TV were from the 70s. Yeah. So that's also part of my life, part of me grow, growing up as a kid. Um, and... Um, but then I just realized that the theater that I talked about was too small and um, people wouldn't pay to, to, to go there. So if I wasn't going to have um, financing from the government, like a, a grant 
it, yeah. it, would, it wouldn't be we wouldn't be possible and it just seemed like a like a dream you know like yeah it would be cool but uh I'll, I'll, this, this is impossible i'll never get get to do this and um and 10 years went by and, and then i was just talking to to a friend of mine and i was we were having a coffee we were talking about normal things and i really don't know why it came up to the conversation that I had this idea of a theater that would screen iconic movies. And he told me, hey, why don't you, why don't you talk to Katerina? You know, she, she's working in, that, uh, in, a, in a theater, you know, doesn't matter which theater it is, mm -hmm. but she's working in that theater, you know, and uh, maybe she can give you a help. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, in three months, Cinepop was working, you know. <laughs> It's amazing. In just three months, it was uh, it was like a, a really big theater with 700 seats, um, with a really good quality. Uh, you can watch uh, you can watch iconic movies uh, every Sunday. Every Sunday is it still it's still out active, right? No, unfortunately, it's not since uh, since the pandemic, okay. and uh, uh, even even though the commercial theaters are working uh, because this theater um, belongs to the city hall mm -hmm. and it's also the place where the politicians have their weekly their mm -hmm. weekly meeting you know um, they they still for them it's still too dangerous mm -hmm. so unfortunately it's still on hold and uh, i don't know when when it can go go back but um, I, i'm trying to to make it happen in 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 other places but because this is not my main business uh mm -hmm. and because this year i i directed my my latest film my my mm -hmm. my tv movie so i really couldn't focus on that okay well i mean we never know what's going to happen after the pandemic because we still don't even know how long it's going to last so just let's just yeah. you know, fingers crossed and wish for the best yeah um, yeah that's Nowadays, many productions are for digital platforms such as Netflix, HBO, Amazon Prime, um, Apple TV. Do you think that this is the future of film? Or do you think that um, our present theaters are still going to be um, screening films? Uh, I think the, there's going to be a, a mix of that. And, um... What I'm going to say, it's, it's not just my opinion. Uh, I read it, and it's, it's kind of like what the producers and the distributors are planning to, to make it happen in, in the, maybe in the next 10 years. And uh, what's going to happen is that uh, theaters or a certain type of films will be showing theaters just like a pop star makes uh, the a yearly tour okay you know you pay to go and see that show and um or a circus you know the, mm -hmm. the cirque the, du soleil uh, you know the, those kinds of spectacles the, the performances um and, and it's going to be that way so you're going to to you, uh, a movie from marvel you know Uh, or kind of like uh, Harry Potter or something like that. It's going to be like a huge show, interactive with, you know, these things. And uh, the tickets are going to be a little bit more pricey, but it, it's going to be a spectacle, you know. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you're, go and you're, go you're going to want to watch it two or three times, you know, mm -hmm. because it's, it's such an entertainment spectacle. Uh, and then movies as we know them today, you know, like indie movies, the, the indie, indie, which is like kind of the, the normal movies nowadays, mm -hmm. like movies that aren't about superheroes and that aren't about, you know, like, you know, uh, explosions and stuff like that, which I like. I'm not, you know, I'm not talking bad stuff about, about the, those movies, uh, but the rest of the movies, They will go to these uh, underground theaters, uh, different theaters, and there will be very few. And um, but but the, the 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 main distribution for these movies 
will be internet. You know, you you will have big screens in your house. The the big screens are cheaper uh, every day, every year. You can have like a giant screen, much cheaper than the year before. And uh, nowadays, even a video projector is so cheap. I remember just ten years ago, if you wanted to have a video projector, even if it was a bad video projector. It was so so goddamn expensive, you know. Mm -hmm. And now you can have a video projector that it's this size, and it's going to fill out your whole wall, you know. So you didn't, you don't even have to buy uh, a TV anymore. If you have a big wall, you will have uh, this huge image inside your house. And you, if you have a good stereo, you don't even have to have an expensive stereo, you know. Just have like two speakers. And you will have like a mini cinematic experience uh, in your house. Uh, so, I, yeah, th that will be the, the future for us normal filmmakers that don't that don't make Marvel Studios movies. That that's how it's going to be. Yeah, but that I think that um, unfortunately, um, I want to be very um, how, how to say this. I believe that um, theater will always exist because it's an uh, event. It's an event to go with your with your, uh, your 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 couple, with your family, with your children, with friends. Um, it's an event to go to a theater, and it's it's a day out. It's a night out, an evening out. You have dinner afterwards, or you have dinner before, and it's just an event going out. The other way around, it's. I just don't think that will ever be a hundred percent because it will make us more um, individual and less collective. So I yeah. don't think um, that there there will still be a lot of people wanting to go to a, a theater and 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 see us the screaming the screening of a film. Me, for instance. Um, I do like to go to theaters, especially when we are talking about special effects films. It's the best way to see it is in a Dolby surround um, uh, room with a huge, huge, gigantic yep. um, um, screen and having all these effects around you. Mm -hmm. you. It's the only way you can feel you are part of the film. And I think that a television no matter how big, unless, obviously, you do have the room in your house to make a cinema theater in your own house. If that's not the case, you, the feeling, what you feel watching it at home is, will never be comparable to how you feel in a theater. Never. Yeah, no, but maybe I explained myself wrongly. I'm saying that, that that's what's going to happen. Like, yeah. Ma mainly those movies with explosions and special effects, those are the ones who will be most every theater, you know, that, that, that's what's going to happen. And that they are going to be even huger, you know, they are going to be even bigger, you know, and you're going to pay to watch it two times, three times and four times in, in the same year. And then what I was saying is that the other movies, the dramas, the comedies, you know, uh, those kinds of movies, there will be much fewer theaters that will be screening those movies because it's not just, um, it doesn't pay, it doesn't have, give profit to the mm -hmm. ones that have the theaters. Yeah. Uh, and people will watch these kinds of movies in their homes because yeah. they, you know, they will have like a video projector to watch a comedy. It will be mm -hmm. more than enough. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not like that, but unfortunately, People, uh, you know, every year they want to watch these things at home, you know. They want to go to the movies, but usually they want to go to the movies to watch that spectacle, you know, the, the, the explosion, the action, and the adventure. And just a, a tiny portion of people in the future mm -hmm. will want to watch uh, a drama uh, in the theaters or a comedy in the theaters. I will be one of them for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think we only have about, um, I don't know, because I, I didn't even check out the time. I think we only have 15 more minutes. I still have okay. quite, a few, quite a few questions. Okay, I'll be brief, I'll be brief. Let's make, let's make them short, the answers. 
because I would love to, to ask you all these questions. Um, okay, tell us about Nirvana and Train Station. What inspired you while you were writing them? Well, Trains, uh, Nirvana, which was first, it was my first feature film. Uh, I don't have like a really, it's going to be really brief, the, the answer. <laughs> uh, I wrote it when I was still in high school. It was my last year of, of high school. And I wrote it to shoot it during the summer because I had this really, I, I went in uh, the, the last part of high school, the, the last three years of high school, it was in a special high school that you only have two in Portugal, that, which they are already in the arts department. You have one in Lisbon and one in the north in Porto. And so, which means that this school was already towards arts in general, and then you could choose the art that you wanted to specialize, and I was in cinema and video. And so I had this really great teacher uh, that he, every year, he managed to have a grant from the education minister to to shoot a movie with the, with his students during during the summer and so i wrote this to, to shoot during the summer but that year uh, they weren't able to have the grant so it was never shot and i think my greatest influence was the the influence from the 90s which was tarantino and i was just writing stuff you know i was <laughs> I was. I just wanted to write the gangster story, and I just started to 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 write characters that are from my neighborhood because uh, I, I live in the middle of two neighborhoods. One is like a, a a nice neighborhood, and the other neighborhood it has a lot of criminality. You know, it has a lot of and but the people would mix with one with each other, and so I know a lot of comic characters. <laughs> from my real life. And so those were the influences for the characters and the influence for the story itself, you know, for the universe and for making this movie was, uh, was especially Tarantino and Guy Ritchie and Robert Rodriguez. Yeah. Well, um, I'm glad to see that um, it was going to be a short answer. <laughs> it was long, <laughs> sorry. Okay, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not um, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm quite ignorant in, in, in these things because, I mean, I'm only an actress. So, okay. uh, Lost Records is your first documentary. How different yeah. is it shooting a documentary than shooting a fiction film? It's very different because uh, in a feature film, you have much tighter schedules. You have a, a daily schedule, you know, you have to do a number of shots per day. Everything is rehearsed. You have a script, you have actors, you rehearsed with the actors, you briefed the cinematographer and everything else. You have the locations, you have everything. Everything is set and then you, every day you know what to do. You have a plan, you know. And in a documentary, you have like a general plan and then you will have a, a weekly plan. Um, and you, you're just like traveling it's, it's just like you're in a road trip with your friends, mm -hmm. but you're working. You, okay. You're discovering things and, and okay. you're making things. Okay. And you don't have a schedule. Okay. Well, um, here now, Instagram is telling me I only, we only have one minute left. So Whoa. I'm very sorry, Tiago. No problem. It was, it was <laughs> wonderful and I loved it. Okay. I would love to, um, to, to thank you for being here um, and sharing this afternoon and your ex experience with us all. I would love to thank everyone else to be, for being there as usual, not only today, but every day. Um, you will be able to uh, follow Tiago's uh, career and in his social media, which I will include um, yeah. in the videos. And just to let you know that our um, guest for Tuesday is the International Basque Director Andres Egiburen. So don't miss it and please be responsible and stay safe. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Tiago. Thank you so bye -bye. much. Bye bye. Thank you for your invitation. Bye. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye bye. bye, -bye.